I've never had a time in my professional life where Americans have been more concerned about their own self-protection. When it comes to crime statistics, is there any reliable information? This is a question that I had a few weeks back when I was trying to finish up something with my uh, latest book. I needed some stats. What I found was wild. And I'm about to share that with you. And I have an expert that's going to come on and explain how to interpret crime statistics and why it's important to you. All right. Before we do that, listen, if you're ready to put your self-protection plan together, go to timlarkin.com. Give us your email. You'll get your free masterclass right away. And listen, guys, it takes a lot to do these videos. Uh, I really appreciate the support, but please continue to share these videos. Please, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Hit the notification button and make comments. Uh, and then, of course, most importantly, you know, find friends that like this type of information and let them know this channel exists. All right, thanks. Um, so listen, a while back, I did an interview with, uh, one of my friends in the industry, Mark McYoung, and I contacted Mark, um, for a variety of reasons. First of all, Mark, uh, you know, focuses most on these days in legal defense of people that, uh, get accused, uh, or go to, uh, court with self defense issues. So he's extremely knowledgeable that way. And I reached out to him about crime statistics. And what was really interesting was the feedback he gave me was just so jarring that I wanted to share it with you. And it's very relevant to your self-protection. Now, Mark and I, as always, we start off there and we get really good information you know, coming out of there. But then we quickly talk about current cases that are going on in the news, including uh, Rittenhouse as well as what this means for the future and where we're going. And what's interesting is we talk about a lot of different things. Uh, we talk about Steven Pinker's uh, TED Talk on um, violence. You know, the fact that he feels that uh, we're living in a very safe time in our, our, our life. There's an interesting twist to that that I think you're going to find interesting. But anyways, I hope you enjoy uh, part one of my discussion about crime statistics with Mark McYoung. Mark McYoung, thanks so much for cutting away some more time to talk about, uh, you know, how the world is changing and how the world is looking at violence. But in particular, I reached out to you about two weeks ago because I was having a hell of a time just reconciling crime stats to share in a new book that I have coming up. And I told you some of the challenges I had in you basically were able to give me a white paper on how to look at statistics when it comes to to crime but then we got into the bigger story of saying you know where are we at you know as a society right now where are we progressed to uh, as far as violence and you know the 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 ramifications of society and yet what we've just seen happen in the last you know year and a half is there's, there's going to be some interesting results and i'll just set it up that way for the conversation but can we start with the idea that um, you made a very good point of, of pointing out sources and then biases in each one of the sources. And essentially, you talked about, you know, the FBI and the DOJ have very, you know, they're known as the gold standard, basically, for the, from the government side, you know. Yeah. But can you explain their approach? And then also what you found equally frustrating is when you find organizations who are incentivized to overplay what may or may not be happening so could right. you just explain to everybody how, how that's something that we're all getting manipulated with okay um i believe i started my response with um there are no statistics out there that are worth using as toilet paper right right now that's a very shocking and did by the way notice i toned that down yes you did <laughs> um you're looking at something that is so incredibly complex that it cannot be covered by any one source. Now, let me tell you a story about a friend of mine who was going to that place, doing that thing with those guys. Right. Right. Well, um, that's his job. But before they went there, he was showing the, all the diseases that could kill you on that continent. Right. And what he did is like, here's where Ebola is, here's where malaria is, here's where, and I mean, 
and what had happened, he did overlays. Okay. And it got so bad that if you ever notice, you got so many different colors, they all kind of turn into a muddy black. Right. Right. And that's what pretty much a lot of the continent was. And his boss looked at him and said, um, could you, or somebody that he was giving a report to said, uh, could you make this a little simpler? And I was like, no, sir. These are all the things that will kill you. (laughs) But, you know, when you look, when you're trying to understand crime and violence, you have to take overlay approach. Okay. You have to look at all these different sources see what they say and that's a layer and then another layer find somebody else now you know um one of the things that is out there is the feds are the remote are the most reliable source of information about violence okay i say that without any hesitation i will also tell you that they are also everybody knows their numbers are ridiculously low. They are not an accurate reflection of what is happening. They are, however, a baseline that we can say, okay, here's the, at the very best, the lowest numbers. Right. Okay. Now, a lot of that has to do with how the process is done, like the Uniform Crime Report is voluntarily reporting to the feds when you have, you know, your location, your town, your state, and nobody really wants to admit the actual numbers, right? It's hard on property values. So they kind of admit it. Um, I read one report that I loved that according to officially reported numbers, there were absolutely no murders in Chicago that year. (laughs) I saw that when you pointed that out. Excuse me. Um, So, yeah, they really do. You know, there's a lot of stuff going in. There's also like, how do they define it? Okay. And numbers go up or down with how you define something. Um, One of the things about the FBI or. Yeah, some of the sources define mass shootings as, you know, federal standard is, quote, officially three or more people died without the shooter okay not counting the shooter now in the small print you read oh wait a minute um we're not including terrorism we're not including uh you know family violence murder suicide and oh while we're at it we're not including crimes either crazy okay and that's where you get like yes there were 63 incidents you know 63 mass shootings Okay. Um, And yeah, using that metric, that is true. Okay. But when you start adding in stuff and changing these tweaks, this is where you begin to find different numbers and what's involved. Say, back before they started doing the things like taking out this, that, and the other thing, there were a higher number of mass shootings. Right. But Terrifyingly enough, a lot of them had to do with gang fights or, you know, dad pops a cork and murders the entire family. Right. So, again, the, you know, baseline is really, really important to have. Now you start doing overlays from different sources and like, what do you mean by this when you say it? Um, I did a, I was reading something about the numbers of rapes in Denver. Okay, from the Denver um, local rape group. And I went, wait, something's wrong there. Okay. And I sat down and I did the math, literally. I'm not making that up. I did the math. And I took the population of Denver, took their reported rapes, and I realized that if you say half the women for the pop, you make up half or women make up half the population, the numbers were exactly half of that every year. Jesus. So according to this organization that I'm supposed to trust, 
Um, every woman in Denver is on a biannual rape cycle where oh, it's this year, it's your turn to get raped this year. Right? Crazy. Because they were claiming literally every year one quarter of the population was being raped. Okay. And does nobody just like uh, you obviously did, did the work on on this and and i know you had an exchange with them but is it just are these organizations just they they put this out just hoping people just are going to take it at face value and that's uh, kind of where that stuff is is. a big part of it because remember we're talking funding right right and if most people i mean really who wants to do the work of looking at statistics yeah um you know it's easier to quote statistics Okay, it's easier to say things um, and, you know, back your argument using proof of statistics. Okay, without ever looking into the credibility of those statistics. And, you know, when I contacted these people and it's like, hi, I have a question. <laughs> just, just, excuse me. <laughs> I was kind of like the little troll into the bridge coming, uh, excuse me. Um, it was like, oh, well, we're not talking about just Denver. We're talking about the entire metropolitan area. Okay. Which is like, oh, now we're talking a couple million people instead of just, you know, a low hundreds of thousands. What else? Well, it's not just rape. It's also attempted rapes sexual assaults, unwanted contact, yada, and they began to really expand the definition. So if you were a woman and somebody accidentally bumped in your boob, onto your boob, um, they counted that as sexual assault, right? And which was the same that they were saying as rape, okay? The real booger, however, was estimated okay and whenever you hear that word little red flag should pop up <laughs> okay is it as insidious as it's like the catch-all it's like it's like okay numbers aren't really where we need to be so let's throw an estimated in there and that'll get it where I, we want it to be yes and Okay, you're right on that one, um, but it's also a how do we cook it? By what process do we make these made up numbers sound realistic? Now, I encountered one, you know, different place, um, but it was like, how did you get these numbers? It's like, because they are way more than what the police have reported in this area. And it's like, well, we when we deal with these, case, these rape cases, um, only one out of 10 women want to go to the police and report. Okay, that still doesn't give you the numbers that you're promoting here. Okay, and I understand that, that you work more. And by the way, can I see these numbers? No, they're, they're private. They're confidential. So you're giving me statistics with no source. Right. Um, you know, I was born at night, but not last night. Um, but then what I looked at and I was like, so what I'm seeing here looks like you're using the same proportion of, you know, one, one woman willing to go to the police to your, of your 10 cases and you're estimating the same thing. So like you're estimating every case that comes to you, there's 10 that are not, that they don't come. Okay. And I mean, you've kind of floated out in flakiness land here. And we don't know what the real numbers are. But here's the trick. You will see the, the word estimated once. Okay. And after that, it just magically disappears, never to be seen again. Okay, but they will be presenting the estimated numbers as actual numbers, right? And yeah, there is a lot of money to be made 
I mean, there was like four billion dollars for the Domestic Violence Act. Right. Okay, that's a pretty big food trough for people, and there's a lot of incentive for people to get funding for their programs and their approach by quote raising awareness. Okay, they're providing, and this isn't just okay. This isn't just providing this information to lawmakers, right? Like why you have to put, you know, pass this law. This is endemic in the entire thing of this is why you have to give us funding. Okay. These are the, you know, this is our program. You have to hire us to teach this stuff, right? And there really is a lot of teaching involved here to raise awareness. Sometimes I go, excuse me, wait, what? Now, um, there's a guy named David Lysak who did a study and it's questionable, but it was undetected rapist. That was really, never mind actual conviction. Okay. Um, I think it was 1800 men interviewed. And of them, 120 of them self-reported doing a lot of really unpleasant stuff. Okay. And I'm talking about violence, child abuse, rape, you know, theft, all this stuff. Okay. So out of 1,800, 120, and this was from college students. Well, then they said, well, wait a minute. Of these 120... With all this other stuff they've done, uh, 120 of them, um, what they admitted to without being directly asked meets the legal criteria of rape. Okay. Now, I don't have necessarily a problem with this, but we're also talking, including, you know, they, they talk about date rape drugs, right? Yeah, well, the biggest date rape drug is giving a girl access to a bottle of booze, free, okay? And letting her binge drink herself, right? And then when she's good and drunk, take her upstairs or get her upstairs and feed her booze. Um, and yeah, that is a real date rape, pushing it, you know, Okay, I'll give you that, but by the legal definition of rape in some states, you know, drunk sex is rape. And I mean, like, even you and your wife going out, having a few, coming home, technically speaking, that's rape, legal definition. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yes, there's some biased you know, who's going to get accused of it. Um, but, you know, saying that they've got this, you know, meeting the legal definition, but not telling you what that legal definition that they're using. Okay. Now, Lysak originally found of the 120, I think it was 72 of these guys um, were could be considered repeat offenders. Okay. And by that, I mean, so you get a chick drunk at a frat party and screw her. Okay. Or did you actually like pounce on somebody in a dark alley? Okay. Cause those are two, but using this, um, and by the way, there's all kinds of stuff that does go on with frat houses. Make no mistake. Mm -hmm. Um, but he said of these guys, they had on an average of uh, 5.6 incidents that they reported. Okay, now I'll give you that, right? But somehow in the translation, it got inflated to 7, 9, 15. Okay, now... When you're talking about, and I saw it before it got pulled down off the internet, 
I saw his PowerPoint be, that was being taught to sex crime investigators down in Fort Carson. And there, in his own PowerPoint, it said that, you know, these undetected rapists had con, con, uh, done 15 prior rapes that they have never been caught for. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You just jumped to that. How the hell? And I mean, this is why when I've talked to rape advocates and their comments of like, well, all rapists are serial rapists. Yeah. Um, you know, the problem the problem I have with this is is um you know because I obviously you know in our industry I deal with a lot of women that, that have had true sexual assault that have yes. true rapes too and the problem is when you when you do this especially the, you know, I think the Me Too movement in a lot of ways really did a lot of damage to real victims and yes. that's what that's what pisses me off is the fact that the people that actually need you know they're being washed in with these these just low level just you know somebody who's an annoying jerk is now the same as a Full, full, you know, you know, full on yeah. rapist. Yes. And, and that's that I think that ultimately hurts it hurts, you know, sexual uh, assault, you know, organizations, basically. Well, and okay. I have a little habit that I do. And that is I find professionals in a field, I feed them alcohol. <laughs> and then I get them talking shop. Okay. Now, um, and this is one of those real problems of people who tell you, oh, well, you know, false accusations of rapes are only 2%. Okay. Well, these are sex crime investigators that I, you know, we're talking. And it's like, look, I know here are these things that you know it, you got it, you nailed the dude. Yay, good for you. Here are other times where you know the guy did it. It is this kind of attack, but you can't prove it. Okay. And they're like, yeah. And I said, now I know these, here are all these gray area cases that it just is not cut and dried. But how many of the cases have you investigated that you knew were bullshit, but you couldn't? prove it and this is where it got scary because they depending on where the officer's jurisdiction was the numbers changed okay so in a regular city environment the answer was between 25 and 30 percent okay now, just side trip here. Um, it's actually harder to, it's easier to get a conviction for rape than it is to prove that a charge of rape is false. Now, the reason for that is that there's two standards. Number one, you, um, you know, the dude did it. He's the accused. Now, number two, if you, if you can clear this guy, you then are left with how do you disprove that a rape happened? So we don't know that a rape didn't happen. Okay, we can't prove that it didn't happen. We just can prove this guy didn't do it. Now, one of the biggest example I've ever seen of this where what it takes to disprove it was a guy had been accused and it turned out he not only had an alibi, people were going to you know, say, yeah, he was with us, but there was video of him at a restaurant with his friends. Okay, he didn't do it. We can pretty well say that he didn't do it, right? What, what got her and why they were able to prove that the rape didn't happen is her, her phone GPS indicated she wasn't there at the time she claimed the rat rape happened. She was somewhere else too. <laughs> Just um, so you know what happens with a lot of these uh, you know cases, and this is also why the advocates say, "Well, these cases aren't cleared, right? Never mind the you know we know the guy did it. We can't prove it. Right. 
um, what about those questionable ones? But then we can't prove that it's a false accusation. Okay. So yeah, 25, 25 to 30% with um, just average cops. 30 to 40% were cops that had certain areas of specialty. Okay. The scary thing was the people who had universities in their jurisdictions, all of them said between 40 and 50%. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, you know, when, a, when cops tell you half of the cases they investigate, they know are false, but they can't prove it. There's something skewed here. Okay, so the thing is, when you look at statistics, right, you really have to take not just a grain of salt, but bring an entire salt lick. Yeah. Okay, and one of the better ways to handle this is to do overlays from different sources. Now, um, I and the thing when you and I were talking about, I mentioned not only the feds when it comes to mass shootings but the gun violence archive. Right. Okay. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to go look it up. Yeah, I, th it was fascinating. And, and you're absolutely right. You get a lot of great information out of it, even though their, their whole charter is, you know, basically anti-gun, but they actually do a really good job of helping out with the whys. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, the gun violence archive's definition of a mass shooting is not only dead but wounded right. right and it starts with one or more or you know more than one person dead or wounded including the shooter right. okay um and you know it's like a murder suicide in the gun violence archive is deemed a mass shooting right okay people get wounded it's a mass shooting Right now, with again, it's su such fascinating um, reading. Okay, because they are using newspaper reports, but they're also giving the addresses and the areas, right, where you can begin to see where these mass shootings are, and they'll give you kind of like a rundown of the number of parties where somebody gets thrown out, comes back and shoots the place up. Right. right. Um, so yeah, you get a really good, you know, set of information about, you know, p multiple people getting shot. But, you know, that is comparison to what the feds claim. So again, statistics, if, if the person is not doing an overlay approach, the odds are there's an agenda in there. Yeah. Well, I see it oftentimes, um, you know, obviously my wife's with, uh, with uh, Las Vegas Metro, and it's interesting to see all the groups that she works with. She's, she's, she's heads up Homeland, so she's with everybody at the Fusion Center, and how they use statistics and then do things. And I remember a very interesting conversation I had with uh, the medical examiner in Vegas, Mm -hmm. And you know, we're talking, we're talking about statistics, we're talking about death rates and everything like that. And he said, well, you know, and he said, what's really interesting. Um, he said, yes, he said, homicides have gone down. He goes as far as, you know, if you look historically, they've gone down. He said, but nobody ever, it never really asked the whys. He said, a lot of it is merely the improvement in medical technology. He yeah. said, what it killed you five years ago, we can save you now. Um, does that mean that society is any less violent necessarily he, he was bringing up he was bringing up all these questions right I thought it was fascinating because there he is on the front lines every day seeing this realizing yep. you know hey two years ago i couldn't have saved this guy but the, but look they saved him and you know now he's not on my he's not on my stainless steel plank here he's he's, he's still yeah. running around yet the the violence itself was the exact same type of violence that resulted in a murder you know yeah before this so it's just it's it's just something that i think people need to consider with the jump being that the jump is if there's a reduction that somehow means there's less um 
intent out there. There's less violence or, or, or human nature's changed. And that's not always the case. You know, not only no, but hell no. Um, yeah. Humans are amazingly consistent animals. I, I, a friend of mine, we were talking about uh, Gen Z and these kids having a grasp of technology that is just beyond me. I, I, it's, it's an amazing these kids just kind of intuitive grab to technology and uh, my friend summed it up very well he goes yes we'll never have that level of skill but human beings are old tech and that is the thing that you know we've gotten there's so many things that have changed but at the same time we as humans have remained the same. Now, when we're looking at this, one of the things that I wrote a book on multiple attackers, and it was, you know, I'm court recognized on the subject. Um, and there's something that I was discussing in the book where humans actually have two brains in, in the sense of we have the individual brain, okay, where we as an individual function, you know, and we think of ourselves in that in that manner, but we're also social primates, and deep inside of our head, there's a switch where we go from part we go from an individual to part of a group. Okay, now individually, we may not be particularly violent, but when that switch is flipped we become way more violent and on a bigger scale to the point of industrialization. So as an individual, I may not be particularly violent, but as a part of a group, my group and my support for that, right, that group's violence, you know, I, you know, I put on my little cheerleader outfit and go, yay, yay, rock. Um, have you ever... I, my my French sucks, by the way. Have you ever heard of the tricous? No. Okay. These were women who, during the French terror, when people were being marched up to the guillotine, sat there and knitted. Right? As the mob is going, kill, kill, you know, in between, they're knitting. And what they were knitting was what they were calling little liberty caps. So as the guy is walking up, you know, the stairs, or he reaches the, the foot of the stairs, they put the cap on this guy. <laughs> right? And up he goes, and then, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, they were doing it for the cause. Yeah. Right? They were doing this, you know, whatever, you know, there's a line I, I read years ago, which is uh, the first thing a man will do for his ideals is a lie. Yeah. Right. The second thing, and Trump Peter is the guy's name. Second thing is really encourage nasty things to be do, done to outsiders and those who do not agree with his ideology. Okay. I mean, it's open season. I remember there's a famous story in um, during Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, I forgot what town it was in, but it's basically Muslims and Christians living in in peace. You know, literally the day before, yeah. and on the next day, huge conflict. Everybody goes to each other's side. Group think takes over, and people are literally getting thrown off bridges. Um, you know, they, they who the day before were just all neighbors getting along, and it's that whole idea that you said. You know, like individuals can love, but you know, groups hate. You know, yes. do that. And, and group think. I think. I think a lot of times we don't like to pretend that we think we're above the idea of group think, but it's proven time and time again. Human nature. It's. It's. Yeah, the one. Who, for it. Yeah, the one who claims that they're too smart to be in group think are usually the worst at it. They're the easiest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you know. Again, this is where, you know, and going back to what Pinker is talking about, um, or excuse me, the, the, when Pinker says violence goes down, it's really weird because in group think, we become way more effective in our violence, right? And, 
you know, the, the limits that we had on violence have been taken away by the technology when we're doing massive violence. Um, the whole mindset of when, when a group of us um, starts doing violence, there are very few people who are actually doing the violence. But there's a lot of uh, cheering from the stands. Yeah. Right. And there's an encouragement to it. Um, de individuation. Now, the weird thing about this is de individuation is that in a group, we will decide to do things we wouldn't do by ourselves. Okay. The squirrely thing and what makes us kind of hard to understand or hard to nail down, let me rephrase, easy to understand, hard to nail down, is there are some people that it only takes 10 people around going, do it, do it, do it, and they will do it. Okay, there are some people that it, say it takes 100. Right. There are a few people that 1,000 people could be saying, do it, and they won't. Okay. There are still other people that all they need it's not one person telling them it's all all they need is they think somebody has approved it so that's entirely in them and you can't tell where it is with an individual right okay so but again it's that the group pressure pushing it forward uh, or the the pressure of the group is what the person used to give themselves permission. And as you're saying, we've seen now with what's happened in the last year and a half here, um, we've seen technology be able to mobilize group think in a way that it's, it's never been at this scale. No. And, and we're at each other's throats a lot of ways very quickly. Um, I've never, like, I, you know, personally, I've never seen such a loss of friendships, family members, people. I mean, there are literally people that won't talk to each other. Yes. Know, friends of mine that are, are in the, and friends who are very sober, very, very lifelong friends. Yes. You know, that this, this is how powerful this is. And I think what's so relevant, you know, talking about, you know, when I reached out, talking about the statistics, and then we got into this, the idea for people that don't know, Stephen Pinker's uh, TED Talk, I'll make sure there's, there's a link to it in the, um, uh, in the show notes. It's excellent. It, it, it's, it's well done. Um, it, it, what, but as Mark pointed out to me, what's more interesting is not the conclusions. It's the whys of how, why do we get to that point um, in society? And the more interesting thing was what Mark said to me after, which really what I wanted to get on here is, okay, and oh, by the way, everything that Pinker talks about, the knees have just been cut out from under all of that with what's happened just in the last year and a half. And how is a society that has had options, hasn't had to respond with violence, um, you know, in quite some time in, in the manners that we're talking about, you know, that universally prior before the stakes were much higher, people had to respond. But now we've got the society that's not used to it. And yet we're in conditions now where it's most likely going to only get worse. And how will, how will that society go? And what, what are your thoughts on that, Mark? I mean, what are your thoughts on people, you know, falling for the group think, going and mobilizing quickly with questionable data a, a lot of times um but what do, what do we have to prepare for i mean you know what's the, what's the biggest way to inoculate ourselves um first by recognizing it is possible now before we get to that which is important um i gave you an analogy of when you have the comfort and the safety and it doesn't affect you exactly that was excellent please, please. right um the analogy i use is you're walking that you're walking down a mall and there's a construction site and they're out to lunch but a little kid has gotten in there and he got a hold god knows why but you know work with me on this of a drill okay so here you see this kid who is drilling holes in the floor of the mall okay now i ask people what do you do now there, here's always where people want to say what they think is the right answer right oh i take it away i do this it is, and it's like no really i mean just you know most people look over and go hey that's not my problem and keep on going right 
right? Maybe some do-gooder would go, you know, I think I'm going to go find mall security and tell them. Yeah. Okay. But the reason the people who say, oh, I take the drill away. And it's like, that's not really realistic because a lot of times if you take that drill away, the kid's mother is going to show up. Right. And she's going to freak out on you. It's a good chance. She may whoop the kid's ass and it's like, yeah, but rare. Not yeah. Reliable. Okay. Um, so really, we have no skin in the game most time. Right. So it's not our problem. It's not our property. So we can keep on going. Now, I change the scenario and it's like you're on a ship and it sinks and you're in the lifeboat and there you are you barely survived the sinking right and this kid gets a hold of a drill and he decides to start drilling a hole in the boat what do you do yeah completely well, different stakes right completely different stakes completely different reactions okay um yeah you have no problem taking the drill away um, I had a friend who, who answered it by, I throw the kid overboard. Yeah. Right. Now then I answered, which is, yeah, you let him flounder, you grab him by the uh, collar, drag him back. And it's like, you don't do that any, do you understand that? Okay. Now, oh, and by the way, if mom has a problem with that, she goes in too. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No hesitation. The stakes. Now, when you put it that way, people immediately understand the need for violence yeah okay of like hey this is going to kill us all if this happens okay by by i don't want to say raising the stakes by but maybe lowering the conditions where the stakes are that high okay um violence if somebody's doing something that is going to get you killed and viol is violating the laws or the rules of the group, and you can have that, there is a lot more personal investment. Okay, and all of a sudden violence becomes perfectly acceptable. Okay. Um, I was watching the Rittenhouse case and the kids talking about being there to render medical aid and put out fires. And the prosecutor is like, we have professionals to do that. Why did you take it upon yourself? Um, well, because there weren't enough professionals to go around. Right. right, number one. But I mean, just the sheer, it's not my job. Um, you know, as long as you can farm out the violence, the social services, the other stuff, it's not your job. Okay, the state, you don't have any stake in the game. Okay. Yeah. And that is where you run into some really squirrely mindsets about violence. Okay. That's a great place for us to stop. I thought Mark's example of stakes, the idea, you know, talking about a kid drilling, you know, into a floor at a mall versus drilling into a um, rescue boat and how that that differentiates. I can't tell you how important that is, the idea of stakes. And it sets up for part two of the conversation where we start talking about the changing dynamics in the world. Um, again, this is a densely packed interview. There's a lot of great information there. And Mark is truly one of the experts. So please take advantage of it. Part two will be coming up next. And again, please, if you like this information, please go to timlarkin.com. Give us your email. Start putting together with our free masterclass, Your Self-Protection Program share the channel. And again, thank you for all your support.